I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And though how as the day had come, the belfries of Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. You know, I heard the bells on Christmas day is a poem that's written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In 1861, two years before writing this poem, Longfellow's personal peace was shaken when his wife of 18 years, to whom he dearly loved, was fatally killed in an accidental fire. Then the following year, during the American Civil War, Longfellow's oldest son, Charles, joined the army without his blessing. One year later, Longfellow, now 57, and his the widowed father of six children wrote this poem on Christmas Day. The poem's inspiration from Longfellow was hearing the Christmas bells ringing in Cambridge and hearing the choir singing peace on earth. But Longfellow did not see peace. Instead, he saw the world of injustice and violence. He saw selfishness, politics, war, hate, and that seemed to mock the optimism of Christmas. But Longfellow settles, and he arrives at peace, knowing that God is still active in human affairs. And he states that even in the midst of despair and hopelessness, he reminds himself that God is alive and that God's righteousness will prevail. Luke chapter 2 tells the most important story in human history the hope and peace that Longfellow believed in would outshine the darkness. In a world of lies and corruption, darkness, disease, politics, Christmas should remind you that there are no human leaders on earth who can save you. There's no system that can give you peace. There's no government that can make you whole. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short. We live in a world of darkness. Longfellow's poem says, In despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Remember, this poem was written 150 years ago. And, and you thought 2020 was bad. COVID was bad. The election was bad. Wake up. It's always been bad. But the peace of Christmas that we sing about is not human peace. It does not come from us. It is not maintained by us. It is not manufactured by us. It is not kept by us. There is only one divine person, whoever called himself the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the greatest of all prophets. He is the high priest. He is the cornerstone. He is the savior of the world. He is God made flesh. Longfellow needed a reminder of the why of Christmas, the might of Christmas, and the peace of Christmas. And so do we. The why of Christmas. It's the origin story. It's the purpose of Christmas. We call it the reason for the season. And it's beautifully written for us in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 2 says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went out from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, 
and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Did you ever have to wonder why people couldn't just have been counted where they were? <laughs> why did they have to travel someplace else to be counted? Well, it had more to do with property and taxes and less to do with where you were born. It was generally understood that Roman law instructed property owners to register for taxation in a district where they actually owned land. So in first century Rome, since a Jew's property was linked to family, the Romans would certainly have allowed them this custom of laying claim to a family estate for taxation. Joseph, more than likely, owns family land in Bethlehem. And since every person needs to appear in their ancestral homeland, and since Mary was engaged to Joseph and pregnant with child, the two of them traveled to Bethlehem together. Of course, Mary and Joseph would have understood the scriptures, and they would have known the prophecy about Israel's Messiah. He has to be born in Bethlehem. So it must have been truly amazing to them to see these Christmas puzzle pieces fall into place, even if the pieces were official decrees from the Roman Empire. Galatians 4.4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. That means Jesus was born at the most perfect time in human history. We know the story. We know it. We know it better than anyone because Luke writes it down for us and we were told the story as children. But back then, the world didn't know. Some dusty shepherds knew, Joseph's family knew, but that was it. The next day, the day after Christmas, life goes on. Work goes on as usual. Politics goes on. Eventually, Herod learns of Jesus' birth when the wise men come and he becomes fearful. Herod becomes afraid and his jealousy turns to anger. And rather than join in with the peace of Christmas, Herod chose greed. He chose to hold on to power at all costs. Herod reigned over a tidal wave of death, but peace on earth survived. John 1.4 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In fact, the powers of darkness did all they could to snuff out the light of Christmas. Every human scheme, every plot devised behind closed doors was used to destroy Jesus. Being born in Bethlehem, like the prophecy said, the visit of the shepherds, the gifts of the wise men, a tyrant king who tries to kill him, an angel's warning, and a flee to Egypt in the middle of the night, they're all parts of the puzzle that reveal just how important this Christmas baby is. Matthew 1.23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God had come to earth. Our Heavenly Father had become our teacher. The one who lives in infinity came to live a finite existence. And as John writes, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Paul writes in Philippians, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. Jesus wasn't born in a castle. He wasn't born to privilege or wealth. When he was born, he wasn't placed in a cradle with a soft blanket. There were no church bells ringing. There was no choir singing. Instead, Mary wraps up her baby in strips of cloth and places him in an animal's feeding box. There's so many great verses about Christmas in the Bible. Verses like 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. 
you could easily point to just that one verse as to the why of Christmas. This is a great truth behind the holly and the gifts, behind the family meals, behind singing carols. Bible scholars call this the incarnation, God becoming human. The great author C.S. Lewis said it this way, the central miracle asserted by Christians is the incarnation. They say that God became man. Every other miracle prepares the way for this or results from this. The why of Christmas was so that the world could feel God's love, so the world could receive God's mercy, so the world would know God's kindness, so the world could see God's justice. The why of Christmas was so that a Savior could bring all of his holiness for our redemption. The why of Christmas is that God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And now, and now, 2,000 years later, Christmas has not lost its luster or its strength. And we are still feeling the might of Christmas. A God born in the shape and size of a baby. That doesn't make any sense. If I asked you to fully explain it, you couldn't. And don't worry, nobody else can either. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. We can't understand it. How something so big can become so small. Something so strong can become so frail. How the person who created Jupiter and the rings of Saturn could squeeze all of that glory down into the shape of a newborn baby. But he did. But we also can't understand how he remained fully human. He's one of us. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, without giving up his divine nature. He doesn't diminish his deity. He was born unto us as a tiny baby. He was fully human with all the needs and emotions that are so common to us, but he was also fully God, completely wise, all-powerful. This is where the might of Christmas comes in. He was frail, but not helpless. He was meek, but not weak. Other religions, other authors would like to tell you that Jesus became less that he was diminished. But the Bible says otherwise. Paul, in his own understanding, writes these words. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And it was there on the cross that we would think the story would end, that the historical account of Jesus and any long-lasting influence that he might have would end right there with his death on the cross. But it didn't. We all know that something happened. Something that caused his scattered followers to reconnect, to re-engage, and to travel to the ends of the earth to tell others. Within a couple of short months, there were thousands in and around Jerusalem that became the first Christians. Within a couple of centuries, there were hundreds of thousands of Christians in the Mediterranean region. By 325 AD, thanks to Constantine, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Within 500 years, Greek temples to pagan gods were being converted to Christian churches all over the world. What could have happened to cause such a powerful movement? 
How did the baby of Christmas change the world? With his strength. One Yale historian writes, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible, with some sort of super magnet, to pull up every ounce of history, every scrap of metal, bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? This baby, laid in a manger, through his life, teachings, death, resurrection, would one day have a greater influence than the birth or death of anyone in all of human history. How, do you ask? Because of the strength of Jesus, we have greatly improved the treatment of and the teaching about children. And this has led to orphanages and the eradication of child slavery across the world. Because of the strength of Jesus, it has also helped fuel the movement for universal literacy. Sunday school became one of the first places of higher learning where everyone was taught to read. Because of the strength of Jesus, the Council of Nicaea decreed that wherever a church existed, there must also be a hospice, a place of caring for the sick and the poor. That's why even today, hospitals has names like Good Samaritan and Good Shepherd and St. Anthony. They were the world's first voluntary charitable institutions. Because of the strength of Jesus, humility became a widely admired virtue. Historian John Dixon writes, it is unlikely that any of us would aspire to this virtue were it not for the historical impact of the crucifixion. In the ancient world, virtue also meant rewarding your friends and punishing your enemies. But because of the strength of Jesus, we know that what is best in life is to love your enemies and to see them reconciled to you. Jesus had a way of championing the excluded. His inclusion of women led to a community that women quickly became part of. Slaves, which in the day of the early church might make up a third of the population, slaves would wander into church, a fellowship, and there it might be a common sight to see a slave owner wash the feet of a slave rather than beat them. Why? Because of the strength of Jesus and the strength of Christmas. His influence is celebrated at his birth. There have been 2,022 Christmases since his birth, and hopefully there'll be 2,022 more. May we never lose sight of the word that became flesh. 2.4 billion people out of the 7.5 billion people in the world personally call him Lord. And together, we share the news of Christmas. In a world of fake news and political lies, Christmas is the only good news. You heard a lot of bad news in 2020. And believe me, it's not going to go away starting January 1st. When you turn on your TV or you scroll through Facebook, you will still find stories of corruption, scandal, sickness, poverty, crime, hate, murder, and each story will be more heartbreaking than the next. Why is there so much bad news on TV? It's not only the left, it's not only the right, it's everywhere, and we eat it up. We can't look away. We can't turn it off. We can't think about anything else. It consumes us, it worries us, and it keeps us up at night. Why? Why all the bad news? I'll tell you. Because you'll react to it. And the news channels and the media and the TV producers, they know it. Our human brain doesn't react as strongly to good news. We don't react as strongly to positive images or good things. No, we react to danger. We've been taught to react to danger, and we have a heightened sense of awareness 
for danger ever since the dawn of time. Our natural inclination is to keep ourselves out of danger. So when we see danger, we pay attention. Guess who wants all of your attention? TV, Facebook, YouTube. They will do anything to keep your attention. They will create any story, twist any truth, break any rule to keep you watching. And they're good at it. They've spent millions in research and development to keep you right there, watching bad news. And now what? You're worried. You're stressed. You have doubts about the future of America, the future of the world. Remember our song, our poem? In despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And yet, while Mary and Joseph are in Bethlehem, and the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Christmas brings good news. God alone brings good news. What did the angels say? They said, don't be afraid. Only God can bring good news for you. You are his. You are his creation. You are his children. And so he has news that will only bring comfort for you. Don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. Make peace. Take courage. For why? Because a Savior has been born unto you. You can be saved from the bad news. You can be rescued. The good news of the Christmas story brings joy and peace, and it takes away fear. And all through his ministry, Jesus reached out to people who had received bad news their entire life. People like Zacchaeus and Levi, prostitutes, the demon-possessed, strangers, foreigners. Jesus even said once, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus comes for the lowly, to the most undeserving, to the neglected, to the marginalized. Why? In order to show his strength. Listen, the world does not win. Darkness does not win. The bad news on TV, politics does not win. Christmas wins. Christmas says, fear not. Behold, I bring you great news of great joy that will be for all people. The angels help us see that God has a message for sinners and everybody else just like us. We matter to God. We matter to God. The peace of Christmas reminds us that we matter. The angels depart with these words, and they have adorned every Christmas card, and they appear in every Christmas song. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Peace is so important. We want to live in a world without pain. We want to live in a world without fear. We want to live in a world without war or hatred. What do we want for Christmas? We want peace. We want to live in a community that is known for forgiveness and friendship and mutual care where any loneliness or any pain is immediately met by a concerned neighbor. We want a family, right? We want a family where there's no misunderstandings, no drama, no arguing, no silent treatments, no outcasts. 
And there is only mutual respect and love and peace and concern and compassion for one another. Jesus is the gift of God given to the world. Jesus is the peace of God given to the world. There's a lot of key words associated, thrown around with the Christmas message. Words like love and peace and joy and giving and yule. But out of all of them, out of all of them, the highest up on the list is peace. Christmas is about peace. You remember, ever since you were a kid and you were brought to church by your parents on Christmas Eve, we were all taught that this was about the Prince of Peace. And we sang Silent Night, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. We sang It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, which is about peace on earth. We sang Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which is about peace on earth. The purpose of Christmas is to give you peace. The purpose of Christmas gave you the Savior that you needed the most. Five times in the New Testament, Jesus is called the God of peace. And Jesus even said, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And Paul says in Ephesians 2, Jesus himself is our peace. So if we want peace to rule in our lives, then God must rule in our lives. Christ must rule in our lives. The why and the might and the news of Christmas is about the Prince of Peace born for you. Peace has come. And if you want to live in a peaceful world, if you want to know peace in your hearts, then we need to let the Prince of Peace have all of us. When the peace of Christ rules our hearts, then we will experience his peace. When we know Christ, we will know peace. Even at the end, in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, and if, and if you will open the door, I will come in, and I will eat with you, and you with me, each one of us has the same invitation from God that if we just open the door of our heart that we would allow him in. And what happens? When we receive him, we will know it. And his peace will rule our lives. And as we experience him more and more each day, his peace will shape who we are. And as we're changed, as we are changed, the world will change. The bottom line is, if we want more good news in the world, we have to be the good news. Jesus brought peace. And now it's our turn. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. We'll see you next week.